Good evening, everyone here from Launchy. Um, what an eventful day we had today. We started at 10 a.m. with a very insightful and inspiring keynote from um, Emily from EXO Works, and then we continued with uh, sessions from our partners. I wish I could have watched all of them because from what I've seen so far, the content was really great. And I guess that some of you uh, were working today and uh, they couldn't join the sessions as well, but don't worry. We will make sure that we have recordings from all the sessions and we're going to put them online and spread them in the community. Um, today uh, was the track for business innovation, which means that uh, in comparison to yesterday, we will focus a bit more on how to do innovation in businesses, regardless if it's a startup, a scale-up, or uh, an, a corporate company, an, an enterprise. Um, as we learned today, disruptive innovation starts at the lower end of the market, which means that uh, challenging economic uh, times like the current corona crisis are actually great for starting a new game-changing project. And why is that? Because businesses and consumers are um, exploring options to satisfy their needs in new, more cost-efficient manner. It's an opportunity for companies to embrace new technology and business models and quickly gain an otherwise unattainable um, competitive advantage. Here with me today, we have invited uh, five uh, really bright minds when it comes to doing in, uh, innovation in, in, in companies. And uh, they're going to share not just their um, experience, but uh, also very practical tips and tricks and how they do that in uh, different sizes of companies. Um, I would like to introduce each of them to you. Um, I will start with Eric Dumas, um, who is the CTO worldwide of uh, SMU and uh, also a general manager of the SMU office in Bulgaria. He brings 20 years of uh, multicultural experience during which he led several companies to successful exits, both in the B2B and the B2C domain from airline distribution, data storage, um, security, corporate communication, to online gaming, music social networking, which is SMU. Eric has held various leadership positions in France, in the US, uh, Japan, Bulgaria, as a CEO, um, COO, CTO, uh, general manager, VP engineering, and then so on and so forth. Uh, he has, um, he was most, uh, um, his uh, position right now at, at SMU, um, or before his position at SMU, he was the CEO of uh, a company called Viant uh, Travel Technologies here in Bulgaria, which was later on acquired by PROS. He has a master's degree in computer science from the University of Bordeaux. Next to him, um, I would like to introduce Ivailo Ivanov. Um, Ivailo is the product director at Limplum a fast-growing multi-channel engagement platform with a total investment of uh, currently $125 million. Um, offices in North America and Europe in Asia. As a part of uh, Leanplum, Evalu is responsible for building the company's long-term product strategy and planning key platforms to develop uh, new activities. He has more than 16 years of experience in tech um, as a software engineer, as a technical consultant for data integration, software team leader, product manager. Um, Evailo holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from the New Bulgarian University, a postgraduate diploma in business administration from the University of Sheffield, and a specialization in product portfolio management by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or as you know, probably all know at MIT. Now I'm going to introduce the first uh, Stefan in the group. This is Stefan Atanasov. Uh, Stefan Atanasov is the Chief Product Officer at Pro7 Sat1. He's based in Munich, but also quite often in Sofia. Why? Because this is a German media company that last November announced the opening of an R&D division here in Sofia. And before becoming uh, Chief uh, Product Officer at uh, ProSieben Sat1. Stefan was also a Chief Operating Officer at ProSieben Sat1 Streaming Services, Max Dom, where he headed all product management, um, experience, design, and also technology teams, and played a key role in preparing the transition of the Max Dom to its successful uh, to its successor 
business join. Prior to his role at Maxdom, he served as Vice President Strategy and Operations for Digital Entertainment and E-Commerce Business. Stefan has a master's degree in business uh, from the University in St. Gallen in Switzerland, where he received, amongst others, a scholarship from the German Academic Foundation. And he also has a bachelor's degree in communication science, just like me, uh, from the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Now I'm going to introduce the second Stefan. I hope we will not get confused in the conversation today. This is Stefan Zlatev. Um, Stefan is an investor at Breakthrough Energy Ventures, um, an engineer by training, specializing in energy technologies and having worked in the aerospace industries from in both in Europe and in Japan. His career aspirations led to, to him to pursue an MBA degree in the US. Stefan is currently a member of the founded Bill Gates uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, um, where he's on the lookout for companies and bold entrepreneurs that leverage innovative technologies and uh, to help address climate change. Last but not least, I would like to introduce Miroslav Gechev. Miroslav is the CEO and the co-founder of a company called Develiat. Develiat's um, purpose is to improve the quality of life on Earth by harnessing IoT technology to advance access to clean air and water. The Velvet is indeed a spin-off uh, from one big IT service company and infrastructure, and one, maybe one of the biggest infrastructure players in Bulgaria called Telelink. Miroslav's interests lie in the development of successful teams, great individual contributors, and enduring companies. He has a master's degree from the Technical University here in Sofia but also a master's degree from Alborg University and the uh, Kotrugli Business School, backed by publications in prestigious international scientific conferences as well as in uh, Springer's engineering journals in the US. And before I continue to the discussion, um, there was an interesting fact that I learned today. When it comes to innovation, um, it doesn't really come down to the having the right answers, but more to having the right questions. This is why my first question would actually go to all of you. Um, and I would like to make a connection from what we have discussed yesterday evening, maybe you have watched the discussion, to what we're going to discuss today. Um, yesterday we discussed the transition of the local tech ecosystem from an outsourcing destination to an internationally relevant hub for innovation and product development. You're both acquainted with the, with the environment here in Bulgaria. So I'm going to ask you, how optimistic are you about such an outlook? And if you're optimistic, how do you see your role in this transition? Um, maybe I, I would like to start with Eric. Well, I think it's, it has to be a very optimistic perspective when we look at uh, the country focus on outsourcing 15 or 20 years ago. And it has a step-by-step -step transition to a product-producing country. Um, it started by outsourcing, but some offspring into the gaming industry. And I think as the years have been going, what we can observe is more and more of those outsourcers are being sold to product companies. And additionally, more and more companies are doing real product out of Bulgaria. Too often, they are subsidiaries, but we start to see an interesting ecosystem of small companies doing product. I think it has been facilitated too by the arrival of a certain amount of investment funds. We know that there are local investors such as Blanchard, Nevec, New Ventures, and you name them that has enabled really to foster a little bit the startup scenery. Uh, so probably the evolution over the last 10, 15 years have been extremely strong. And I think Bulgaria is just missing a few unicorns in those days, but probably it's, it is getting there. It is getting there. So I think it's very positive because the country has the technology, but it had it for a long time. Step by step, it's getting the marketing and the sales uh, mindset. I think on the product management, we start to see some very strong product managers available. So the various pieces uh, which are necessary to bring company to success are starting to get there. Additionally, I think there is one factor for me which is fundamental, is we see more and more people coming back home. Today, I have 10% of the headcount of SMUL who are actually coming 
from abroad. They are Bulgarians who came back home. And I think they are very fundamental into enabling this transition from an outsourcing to pure product type of operations. So I'm very, very positive as this stream of people keep going and maybe the COVID is going to help too with this. Thank you, Eric. I guess it's, uh, uh, it makes no sense to ask Stefan Atanasov if, he, if he's optimistic because he was one of the reasons why a company like Prozim Sat Eins would invest here, but still, um, how do you see your personal role in this transition process? So, in the end, I think the, the, the process we're talking about, I think is essential for Bulgaria as a destination for technology, right? Because in the end, innovation and, and, and product is where um, value is created, right? And if you cover that part of the value chain as a destination and uh, you specialize in it, you obviously become the destination where value is, um, is created. And I think this is essential for Bulgaria. And uh, I think on the other hand, we, we, we can probably all agree that it's um, our industry is also a war for talent, right? Because uh, to be innovative, you have to have the right people and the right talent. And uh, in the end, it's really uh, up to the companies who are first mover to um, attract the best talent, right? And uh, if you're an early mover in Bulgaria, you can certainly attract the best talent. And this is why also we decided to go, because I think uh, we clearly see that there is good talent, but we also see, saw the chance to move in as an early mover and attract best talent with a compelling vision and, uh, let's say, a focus on, on product and innovation rather than just outsourcing uh, activities. So I think for us, this is the, the strategic aspect to it, why we moved uh, to Bulgaria. Thank you. Um, yesterday, we also had, um, Ivailo, we had some insights on the topic of talent from your colleague, uh, Vasil Popovsky. What do you think? What is your, I, I guess you're optimistic, uh, but uh, how do you see your role in the whole transition process? I agree with Eric and Stefan um, that this is a process that's already started. Um, is it going as fast as I would like it to see going? No, I would like to see uh, Bulgaria transition as faster. And maybe it's my biased position as a product manager, but uh, I see that uh, in strong um, connection to actually the, the creation of a strong product management community in Bulgaria, uh, the transition from project uh, thinking to product thinking from uh, delivering um, projects to actually delivering customer value. And uh, actually, that's that's how I see my role in all that. I believe in uh, changing the mindset in companies from project thinking to product thinking, and that's, that's what needs to happen uh, in most companies in order to really take advantage uh, of this transition. Thank you. Miro, how do you see your role? Well, <clears throat> Actually, we started from, a, we spin off from a service company. Uh, and I'm definitely optimistic because um, if you think about it, it's an evol evolutionary process. We, you start with service, doing service for someone else. Uh, you gain experience, you gain uh, expertise, and you gain confidence that you can do something better, uh, better than the others on a global scale. And this is what we did at Develiat. We started internally in a service company, got the experience, got the expertise, actually, got an idea what our competitors are doing and we saw actually the flaws they were having and we we reinvented the business model and started doing it better so i think it's an evol evolutionary process that we are um, um, we are taking um, over overall <laughs> um i'm actually now curious what stefan is going to say on the other side of uh, of maybe of the of the whole process from the vc perspective Stefan Zlatev, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, I mean, like to add to the rest of the panel, there is a reason why Breakthrough in general entered Europe, why it's focusing on Bulgaria as well, or Eastern Europe. We believe innovation can happen everywhere, uh, but unless you see what the market needs and what investors are willing to fund, you'll never be able to kind of like focus on those technologies or efforts. Um, so. Breakthrough launched like a $100 million vehicle in Europe, and currently we're looking at East, in Eastern Europe. And Bulgaria is one of our focuses. And we're trying to kind of like 
reach out to universities and figure out what they do. And we believe there's innovation happening. We just can't see it. And unless you can see it, you can't invest in it. And so far, it's been it's early days. Uh, it's been a couple of months. But I've seen technologies where more investors in hardware technologies uh, rather than software. And we've seen technologies around the hydrogen space and food innovation. And as you know, food innovation these days is a very hot industry with companies like Beyond Meat, et cetera. And there are labs in Bulgaria that are doing this innovation right now. So definitely very optimistic about the system. It's actually great to see that you're also optimistic. Um, you come from very different backgrounds, but at some point in your life, you've been part of a, a company on the journey to innovate, um, or you're currently doing it right now. Um, to get on the same page and try to demystify the term on um, what has turned a bit to a buzzword, uh, innovation, how would you define innovation? Uh, where should it fall in the organizational structure of an established company? Let's start in this case with Ivailo. So from my perspective uh, and based on my background, of course, uh, when I'm thinking about innovation, I'm thinking about um, R&D in uh, product companies that I've seen. And uh, from my perspective, uh, innovation is all about differentiation of products on the marketplace, more or less, uh, rather than differentiating, let's say, um, based on innovative business models. And what I've saw is that actually innovation is about uh, DNA of the company, not that much uh, about something separate or something that you invest into. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the right, I think, um, definition of innovation. It's either a part of uh, a company DNA uh, or it is not. And um, actually becoming more innovative uh, involves changing your company rather than um, investing into innovation, let's say. Okay, um, Eric? Sure. I think it is uh, part of our daily job to make sure people do not forget what is innovation. And as far as I'm concerned, innovation has to be everywhere. Uh, people always think innovation has to be a problem of the engineers, I think it's just a subset. The innovation has to be part of the product strategy, has to be part of the product designers, because the look and feel of a B2C application, the simpler it is, the harder it is to make and to build. It is part on the marketing strategy and the marketing execution, how we're going to tackle more intelligently or differently such market. So the innovation has to be um, everywhere in each department. For the rest, uh, nothing is impossible. It often takes a little bit of effort, some chance, and the right people. I like your answer. Okay, so innovation is everywhere. Um, Stefan Atanasov, how is it in a, in a corporate culture? Um, well, uh... I think that's uh, I, I can I can I can only agree with uh, what uh, um, Vilo has said. It's it, and also Eric. Um, in the end, it has to be part of of um, of the mindsets and the DNA of the company. So it's nothing that is uh, can be expressed in certain budgets or separate units or processes. Um, and uh, I mean, I've seen different different kind of setups in the corporate world. Uh, so I've been doing product development and and. Um, in different industries for four years with McKinsey, so from automotive to software and all across the board. So, um, and what you can say about the corporate environment is that first of all, I personally believe and the success cases that I've seen are those where innovation is part of the C CEO agenda. So it has to be backed and it has to be um, cascaded down um, into all the teams and, and into the organization. So it has to be driven by the senior management and by the CEO of the company. Um, and uh, in the end, I also do not believe in isolated innovation units um, as such. Um, I think in the end, it has to be well integrated. You might have certain units that deal with cutting edge technology, that's fine. But uh, I think um, innovation is much more than that. And um, so in the end, you need to spread the know-how, the mindset and the tools needed to make it happen in the organization from top to down. Okay, so 
top-down approach. Miro, in your case, I think it was the other way around. Wasn't it more like bottom-up or...? I think it was uh, part of the of both. Uh, when, it was, when you were asking what innovation is, I think the innovation is just finding a better way achieving practical results. Doing something easier with less time, less effort, get some kind of desired benefit. And what actually worked while, while I was in the, in the bigger company is that innovation is really a mindset. It should be part of the culture. It should be pushing for that. It should be preaching it a lot. And actually, when I, when I started Develiat, I, 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 I think that innovation actually has a brother. And this brother is accountability. In order to have innovation, you have to empower people and keep them accountable for what they accomplish. And if you talk about the bigger company, I'm, I'm very, I think I'm very much with Stefan here that I think you should have two arms. One is for entrepreneurship, this project that are very new, innovative, that's something new for the company, be it, for example, be it a product in a service company. But on the other side, you should be pushing at all levels to innovate your business as, as usual, because this is, this is what is putting money on the table and you want to make it better and better and to keep it better. Stefan Zlatev, what is innovation from the VC perspective? As we, as we heard, innovation can come in different forms. Uh, and it can be a top-down and bottom-up. I do, I do agree with all the speakers that it's a top-down in terms of like freedom to innovate, to come from the top. But then you don't know where innovation is going to come from. So you have to allow every single member of an organization to innovate. Uh, in terms of innovation, quite often what we see is like finding a solution to a problem is the right way to do it, rather than finding a problem to a solution, uh, or looking for a, a problem to a solution. Um, in general, most of the innovation I've seen, in my domain at least, is more on system integration. It's very rare somebody to reinvent the wheel. It's more often to combine all the established innovations in a different package, mm -hmm. with different valuable proposition, with different marketing and different access to the customer. What is gonna be from the top of the, of the funnel, like for example, Tesla being quite expensive, and that's how they reach the bottom, or from the bottom up. And we can talk about disruptive innovation, et cetera, but in general, it, happen, it has to happen across the whole organization. Of course, whether innovation happens and whether it materializes are two different things, because quite often in a big, uh, in a big corporate, if innovation happens, has to fight against other market externalities or even actually internal uh, challenges like the short termism of the public market and other organizational challenges. Thank you. Um, before we dive deep into the future, um, we should probably take a look a bit more on the, on the current uh, position or at the current situation. Um, in very short words, how did the ongoing pandemic affect your businesses, apart from working remotely? Was it good? Was it bad? Were you from the winners? Were you from the losers? Did you manage to pivot uh, a business model, find different solutions? Um, Ivalo, maybe we can start with you at Limplum. How did it affect your business? So I guess we were lucky at Limplum uh, because, uh, first of all, uh, we have extended our C Series D round right before the, the crisis with coronavirus hit. Um, we serve industries uh, that, some industries that were actually hit by the, the coronavirus, but others that even benefited from it, uh, such as, for example, gaming or um, e-learning uh, or health and fitness. And those industries are currently in rapid growth because everybody's at home and they're using their services more and more. Uh, so, in other words, our business plan for 2020 did not change a lot uh, once the crisis hit. Um, I guess some tweaks here and there, but nothing major changed. Uh, we are accustomed to, uh, to changes in general, and we are agile, and we can react. Like you, so you're well prepared for a black swan situation. What about you, Eric, at SMIL? How did it affect your business? Well, music is probably the most personal thing that people have. So we went through a complicated period due to the reshuffling. Uh, we saw a lot of stress in the infrastructure, which is probably the way to translate what has happened. And indeed, uh, I think everybody knows that all streaming services, all music services, as well as some others, have been uh, 
growing during this period. So we are part to the category of the businesses that actually saw their activity positively evolving during this period. It does not mean it has not been challenging because when you provide an internet service to enable people to sing together and you en enable people from Europe and Asia to sing together, there is a lot of complexity around the internet. And the internet lines have been under a lot of stress for the last two months. So this has brought us some different type of complexity to enable us to provide a good quality of service. And I think we went through pretty positively. So it seems to that the entertainment business uh, has been some one of the winners in the crisis. Can you confirm that Stefan Atanasov, um, did you need to change your product strategy uh, due to the Corona pandemic? At so first of all, yes, I can ag uh, agree that uh, um, definitely the on the consumption side, um, there was a huge increase in, in, in consumption in our streaming services, our video content. So people obviously had a huge need for information on the one hand, and on um, for uh, had a need for entertainment on the on the other hand. So uh, that clearly drove up consumption in some cases up to uh, uh, two, three, up to five times what we had before for certain services. Um, and um, I mean, on the monetization side, the picture is, is, is a bit different. Um, obviously, the ad market uh, worldwide was hit um, quite, quite heavily. Right, so uh, not not only in Germany but worldwide um, as, a, as a reaction to the crisis. Uh, on the other hand, what we see flourishing is uh, our subscription models that we have in the market. Uh, so the the D two C offerings uh, work uh, work quite well, and just by by people spending more time on it. Um, and I think what's also interesting with regards to uh, what's the learning and uh, during the the, the 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 pandemic is really that usage patterns change obviously right no surprise and um i think the exciting thing is so how do you deal with it so um uh for example in our case people consumed much more media throughout the day which was similar to the behavior that you would see on the weekends for example so how do you react to it how do you adjust your offerings your schedules your products accordingly so that it's it's matching the new patterns. And I think this is valid for many, many industries. And I think this is really the key to come out as a, as a let's say, uh, winner out of the crisis. If you realize these pattern changes early and react to them, I think this is the key. And this also links back to innovation and product strategy in the end. That's actually very interesting. Um, Miro, your business is quite different. Uh, how was it for you? Did you... Did you pivot? Did you? How does, did it affect your business? I mean, IoT is like, I, I, I can't even predict how is it affecting the IoT sector. Well, at the beginning, we couldn't as well. I mean, we, we, we do our own hardware. So the big thing that happens is that the, uh, the supply chain was delayed. Uh, the thing is that most of the hardware in the world is, and the components are made in China. So the guys really catched, catched up, caught up. So everything is going, going good now. But actually, with the with this coronavirus, the the big thing that hit us was probably delays. We did not lose any deals, but they just got delayed in time. Uh, but actually, we it was good for us because we used this time to uh, rearrange rearrange our roadmap and uh, invest more into R and D and have faster development. Basically, gain the competitive advantage when uh, the things get back to normal. Uh, and you know what? The the something that hit me today is that. These, these times right now are a, a great time to unite your team. I mean, what I saw is our team got closer. I mean, the accountability increased even more. Uh, and actually, all, all people was, were on deck to, to come together from this, to, to um, redo our strategy, to up, uh, upgrade our internal processes, to prepare basically our company for the, for, for the life after all of this is over. So I think what we can get from this crisis is to use it to unite the team additionally and work with that and increase the accountability. Mm. Stefan Zlatev, how 
did it affect your uh, your business, the VC business? I mean, I can I can imagine that uh, the changes weren't that much. In a way, you're prepared for unforeseen, uh, you know, investing venture capital. You're prepared for unforeseen circumstances, right? I mean, well, the, you're always always optimist, right? And then when <laughs> when it comes to times like this. Um, you kind of internally, you focus internally first. You look at how to keep the team together, and then you look how to save the current portfolio. Companies. Uh, it's been quite challenging. I mean, I would say well, it's been very, very long days initially, the, the initial two weeks to figure out what's going on, what does it mean for our portfolio companies. Um, they're in different uh, value chains of different industries, all in the climate ch change space. Uh, but I have. I mean, if it has been challenging for us in terms of like working hours, it's been the most challenging for our founders because like at the end of the day, it's really tough to uh, kind of like lay off people during good times. Um, much harder to lay off good people in bad times. And it's kind of like figuring out the best way to do that. So we give option to our, uh, to all the companies to allow them to actually rehire those people when the times improves. Uh, it's actually the best way forward. Uh, also, like there has been a lot of like other challenges in terms of like the, the United States government. In this case, there was a program that was allowing you for companies to get this kind of like uh, pretty much a lo not a loan. It's actually a forgivable loan. But then, like where to go and do it, uh, and the optics of that—that that was a different question. So, helping our portfolio companies was our focus for the past few months. I guess that's the responsible position of a good VC. Um, from your perspective, what solutions do we need in the post-COVID-19 world? And um, what is the company that uh, you would like to see on the market that doesn't exist yet? Can you make a guess? Uh, of course, um, outside of the COVID-19 vaccine and, <laughs> and treatment. I mean, and testing. And yeah. I think testing. Testing is going to be a big thing over the next few years until a vaccine is on the market. Um, I, we see trends. I mean, the first thing you see is like trends and changes in various. Um, we're a thesis driven VC, so we have thesis in different spaces. And the first thing is like we're seeing which ones are more or less relevant. Uh, I believe everybody is seeing the, tele, the telepresence and the impact that it can have. And a lot of people, a lot of companies realize we don't have to travel that much or as much as before to achieve the same results. What a business travel is going to go away? Definitely not. Is it going to reduce? Probably yes. Um, I've been, we've been thinking like crazy ideas uh, and not that crazy. Like, for example, v, VR, uh, that presence, something which seems quite reasonable to see in the, in the next couple of years. Um, we trends. Uh, so I'm very focused around waste management, plastics, recycling, textiles, uh, additive manufacturing. Those trends, I believe, are accelerated. In general, what COVID did is that it's an accelerator for digitalization. So any companies that are selling products online or, pre or service, I think they're going to benefit from the current, uh, current pandemic. And they're going to be better off after two years. Also, like, interestingly, I was reading about the Spanish flu from 1918. Uh, a lot of people think like pandemics are going to change our lifestyle for good. Actually, in, if you look at history, nothing changes really. It only accelerates certain trends, but nothing is going to change really in the way we see life, at least if we believe um, in history. As I was listening to you, I sensed a certain contradiction. Um, on one hand, uh, Stefan Atanasov, you mentioned that uh, the marketing spending has been cut and it hit pretty hard the ad market, right? Um, on the other side, we have here Ivailo who reported on um, having more like a, um, they didn't experience a downturn in their revenue at uh, Lean Plum. And, I, and my question goes to you, Ivailo. Um, what did it take so that you don't experience uh, this uh, downturn. I mean, you're running a multi-channel marketing solution platform. Why didn't you notice a downturn? It's a very good question. So in general, I, I, I trust in that rule. I think marketing budgets are at risk uh, when, when a crisis like that hits. Um, but 
I think it's up to the nature of the solution that you're providing and how strongly it's connected to creating revenue for the end customer. Uh, because uh, ours is a mobile engagement platform where people are actually counting on us to increase uh, the rate uh, of purchases online or the rate of ad serving online or reduce the churn rate online. And uh, those are functions that do not disappear with, uh, with the cri when the crisis hits. Actually, those are things that even uh, get more important when the crisis hits. And that differentiates uh, us and I guess to some extent our market from, uh, from other types of, uh, of markets uh, of marketing software. Thank you. Um, now I would like to go back a bit more to product strategy. Uh, because you're all in a way responsible for, um, or not all of you, but most of you are responsible for um, building the product strategy of the companies that you're working at. Um, how do you respond to completely something unexpected as a coronavirus outbreak? I mean, we haven't seen such a crisis uh, like ever, or at least our generation. Um, can you make a, a really agile plan that you can withstand, that can actually withstand with something like uh, like the current situation. Um, Stefan Atanasov? Well, I think overall it's, a, it's a definitely an extraordinary situation at the moment um, for us. And as I mentioned, the key to really get out of, of this situation uh, as a winner is to understand the implications on your industry and the change of behaviors and patterns as quickly as possible so that you can adapt um, quickly. So, uh, I mean, in, in, in our case, it's, uh, it's, uh, it means twofold. It means to understand what happens on the advertiser side and how do priorities and budgets shift, but also on the user side. So how does usage patterns change, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before? Um, and so um, I think the key is to, to quickly get a, a get an understanding of what's what's happening uh, understand the data talk to your customers uh quickly and uh then if if you if you have let's say an agile um if you have an agile company you can also adjust to it right so um i think that these are two separate points so the one is are you ready to tackle this kind of change right and is your company agile enough to respond quickly right so this is the prerequisite uh, and if this is in place, then I think the key success factor is to uh, look at data, talk to customers quickly and understand what's happening and how patterns change and then react to it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is what, what we've been doing and this is what uh, in the end leads to some, some, some tactics in the short term. But then again, I think on the longer term, when we really talk about a long term strategy, I'm actually also on basically on the same position that in the long term, I do not see life to change radically from what it was before. So it's more about tactical behavior during the crisis rather than a complete shift in strategy, at least for us uh, in the longer term. How was it for you, Miroslav? Um, did you, were you agile enough to react to what's going on? Is it a question of agility or is it a question of homework that you have done before a crisis like the, like the pandemic hits? I think more, it's more like of an adaptation. It's very hard to predict this and to be ready for this. You know, I, I always quote Roosevelt who, who, who said that uh, plants, are, plants are useless, but planning is indispensable. And actually, what we what we what we are doing in this situation, we are trying to assess what is happening now, where the world the world is going, and how we should adapt to it. Uh, one easy thing, for example, in the last couple of months, is to uh, to rearrange our roadmap because we have uh, we were expecting a faster business environment in the last months, but it turns out we had more time, so we invested into R and D. So for me, what the company should do, it, it's very hard to predict the future, to forecast the future. Probably if we could do that, would be in completely different business. Uh, so for me, what works best is to, to try to be present, to see where the, the things are going, to try to learn as fast as you can, and really to, um, to communicate constantly that you don't have to plan six months ahead or a year ahead, but to be ready to, but yeah, let's plan it, but let's be ready to adapt tomorrow. And you should push this uh, in the whole company and the whole culture. So the guys and the girls will be ready to do it, even by themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's impossible to, to predict and to plan. And still, I guess all of you are in a situation where you um, have a very clear uh, vision of how to do your portfolio management. And uh, having the, the, a diverse portfolio management can be um, a contingency plan for uh, unexpected situations as a uh, crisis. Um, in this sense, I would like to ask um, Ivailo and, and Stefan Atanasov, uh, what's your take on the innovation portfolio management? Do you believe in this 70-20-10 rule, uh, like core business, adjacent and moonshots? Is there a recipe of uh, how many resources a company should allocate to innovation? Let's start with uh, Stefan Atanasov, maybe. Sure. So, um, well, in the end, um, I think it's it's hard to put a rule of thumb for uh, for for capital allocation in the end, right? Because that's what it's all about. So, how much money do you bet on on innovation? I think in the end, it should be more driven by um, let's say the the expected uh, expected ROI and success of ideas. So um, you really need to look at the pipeline of ideas that you have and um, the likelihood of them to be successful and unique. And then you need to uh, basically uh, find the money um, to, to finance them. And maybe in a year there isn't much and in another year there is a lot to invest in, right? And uh, you should really rather make it um, dependent on, uh, on the pipeline of ideas and opportunities that come along. And I, I, I personally think that innovation is also a lot about experimenting. So in the end, um, for me, the, the key success factor is you need to find an, an efficient and lean way to experiment um, and test your ideas quickly and learn quickly uh, so that you can make decisions, right? And to understand, is it something to pursue and further invest on or is it something to, um, to rather stop? Right. So um, in the end, this is this is pretty much uh, our philosophy. So there is no really a rule of thumb. It, it depends on on the ideas that come along and um, on, on the chance of success and then to be quick in deciding to pursue a certain idea, but then also being quick on stopping it and focusing on the next one. Right? Because I think otherwise it's it's uh, it's not sustainable. Um, how was it at Prozim South Ions? I mean, I guess you have mm -hmm. also ideas who are still in the in the testing. Um, did you pull out something from the portfolio management that was just about right uh, a, a right response to the co Corona pandemic? Did you? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, well, I I would say there there were some some uh, let's say uh, nice coincidences that we we had. Uh, we had products launched who, uh, that, that uh, fit quite well. So, for example, we uh, recently launched our um, uh, audio platform uh, for your ears only, FIO. That was just from a timing perspective, um, I think, a, a good move because the, the consumption of, of audio and, and, and audio blockbusters that we have on the platform are um, increasing uh, during these times, but it wasn't planned that way, right? So um, I think in the end, we didn't really uh, uh, pull any significant uh, moves uh, to, as a response. It was rather some technical, uh, tactical adjustments uh, across the products uh, to, to uh, benefit, right? but um, we didn't really make any uh, dramatic change uh, to our strategy just for during the crisis. It was more tactics. Ivailo, uh, how was it on your end? Did you pull out some um, new products, new features that you had already in the portfolio just because right now the situation totally has changed and also the behavior of the customers and the users has changed? That is very similar to Stefan's uh, situation. Uh, we already kind of had um, a strategy that's aligned uh, with what we needed in, in this new situation. Uh, and what happened is that we are speeding it up rather than changing it and making small adjustments along the way. So no, no great changes um, on our side. And in general, I, I also agree with him. I don't, agree, I don't believe in huge uh, like innovation initiatives or innovation departments like 70, 20, 10 uh, rule because the, in the business history, there are plenty of uh, companies that have invested like tens of billions 
in innovation and then ended up failing because somebody disrupted their, uh, their market. Um, and on the other side, like the last time I, I checked, I think the, the average uh, age of Forbes 500 company was 18 years. So things are moving fast and it's all about comp the company being innovative itself as, as we started uh, this conversation rather than um, creating an innovation department and investing a certain percentage of revenue in innovation. Mm. Eric, um, I know that just before the crisis hit, you, pay, uh, you had actually new products on the market. Uh, was it a good guess? Did you adapt them in some way? Uh, we didn't make too much sense in the roadmap, actually. We did none of them. Um, I think we only got persistent to execute what was planned. We have two money, we have three applications on the market, but we have not made major changes. We just relaunched actually an application. We started to relaunch it before the event started. Uh, so that was more of a good uh, luck than anything else. That's an application that was there for a while, the hip hop and the rap vertical, uh, but nothing specific from our side. We, we had a pretty packed roadmap. So the only thing I think we have done is try to accelerate on the execution rather than anything else. Mm -hmm. Miro, as we uh, learned from you today, uh, the Develliot as a startup started in an IT service company. So if you would allow me, I would call you an intrapreneur. Um, you have been part of several spin-offs at, at Telelink. Um, some of them thrived, some of them didn't do that well. Um, do you have an opinion on how an entrepreneurial culture uh, can be created in, in larger companies? What do you think, um, and do you think that actually intrapreneurial intrapreneurship would be an answer to a more sustainable organization in the post-COVID world? I think you're right that in order to do innovation, you, you should make it part of a culture. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that can be learned. Uh, and if you, if you have asked me three years ago what I think about innovation, I would have said that you should definitely keep it as a side project, like uh, if you have to entrepreneur, if you're doing entrepreneurship, you should put a, like make a, like an island of freedom where everything is different, where processes are not followed. I mean, the process of the mother company are not followed. So you have, uh, you're actually acting as a startup and, you're, and your company is acting uh, as, the, as the venture capitalist, but without the value that you can use an established brand and do your demos and, and pilots and stuff, which makes the stuff easier. Uh, now, I still think this is the case, but I, still, I think that uh, for company to be, companies to be innovative, they should instill this on a, on, on a company level scale. I mean, they should, they, should, they should not let business as usual run uh, all by itself or doing the same thing again and again and again and again just because, because it is working. Uh, and I think it comes to accountability. Uh, and this means, Pushing your culture, pushing, pushing a culture of accountability, letting people uh, do small innovations that improve your business. Uh, and it sounds super easy, but it's actually super hard. You have to change a mindset. And especially in an organization that have been working, that been super successful in 10 years, asking, asking it to change might be a nightmare. nightmare. It's not mission impossible, it might be very hard. Uh, so in a nutshell, for me, it should be New products, new stuff should be separate, like an island of freedom, be, a, be it as a, basically as a startup in a company, but the company should also invest into um, building innovation in their culture. And, and on the next one, um, yeah, uh, you know, I think innovation should be done nevertheless, um, not just because of COVID or, or the recession or anything, it's, it just empowers your company to, be, to endure in time. And actually, if you think about it, uh, and when I think about it, it's uh, this crisis will. Uh, it's a it's a great time. It's a great time to start your entrepreneurship journey, because it's very hard to change something where when times are good and everything is going great. Because you usually get the the question, okay, why should I change this? Everything is going perfect. And now, where the crisis hit, when the the board is shuffled, it's. People are more open for change. You can more easily rally, rally them around an idea. It's, for some companies, it might be a life-threatening uh, life situation. So it's easy to 
gather people around a new idea or build your, your entrepreneurship journey. It's just the, the opposition is smaller. So uh, yeah, definitely you should do entrepreneurship. You should do innovation. And now might be the great time to do it because the opposition is small. Okay, so that's uh, um, that's an interesting case of uh, having an opposition in your own uh, corporate corporation when it comes to innovation. Yeah, I think uh, crisis like now can be very favorable for starting your own entrepreneurship initiative. Um, Stefan Zlatev, um, you were briefly also part of the Volvo Scar Tech Fund. Um, do you think that uh, corporate uh, venture capital can be an effective tool for fostering innovation? And when? And could you compare it in some way to having your own R&D lab? Um, very briefly, I was part of the Volvo Tech Fund. Um, so, in general, like, corporate VC has evolved over the past 10 years. Um, so, 2008, there were a lot of corporate VCs. In general, when times are good, corporate VCs uh, realize they can actually start investing with the cash flow the business is generating, and they get into VC, uh, uh, which is great uh, to some extent. The problem is that they have this constant balance between are we investing for a return on investment? Or for strategic alignment, and different corporates have different ways to kind of like find the balance. But quite often, it's the strategic alignment that's prevalent, uh, and quite often corporates overpay for companies uh, because they believe they're. I use the buzzword synergies, but in general, they believe they can extract more value from the company than actually the company being on the market by itself. Um, so. What changed actually since 2008? So 2008, once the crisis hit, a lot of corporate VCs, that's the first thing that they decide to kind of shut down and downsize the corporate VC department or completely eliminate it. Over the past 10 years, one, distinguish, one thing that changed mass, uh, significantly is that they realized instead of investing all our money in R&D, uh, which, which can be penalized by the market in case that R&D doesn't produce any tangible innovation uh, or value, they realize it's much more efficient, capital efficient, to invest in a corporate VC or acquire startups. So as a result, these days, they don't really have the choice. They downsize their R&D department so much, they don't have a choice to find innovative companies without having the corporate VC arm. At the same time, we all realize, wait, innovation can happen anywhere. Um, and it's a very competitive process to get the brightest minds. And more, more often than not, the brightest minds will do something their own. Hence, so like having this ability to acquire innovation, it's quite a significant advantage for the future, uh, for, the, for the benefit of the company in the long term. What happens once a company acquires another innovative company, or one, an incumbent, a big corporation acquires a smaller, innovative, fast moving company? It's quite different because more often than not, the culture of the, of the incumbent and like kills the, the fast-paced culture of the innovative company. Not because they want to, but because the metrics that a fast-moving company is going to be measured against are very different. And there's the market short-termism, uh, where it's more around innovate and produce tangible value right now, not in a year or two time. Thank you, Stefan. Um, my next question... Um with my next question, I would like to address uh, Stefan Atanasov. Um, at Prozim Sat Eins Media Group, um, it, it's a company that has a long history in entertainment in Germany. Uh, I think we all know it, dating back to, what is it, like 1998, as, as my research showed. I'm not quite sure. Maybe you can uh, correct me at this one. Um, at the same time, entertainment is and is also one of the thriving sectors, as we found out to uh, tonight. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the process of generating new ideas uh, and uh, the innovation management is such a traditional environment as the ProSieben Sat1 and uh, maybe you can also share a bit us with us what is the role of the R&D hub here in, in Bulgaria in this innovation process? Uh, yes, so um, I mean in general uh, 
I think in our industry, there is no single day where you don't get like uh, 10 news that are impacting your business significantly, right? So um, uh, the media business is very broad and I think it's, it's, it's uh, more and more becoming a mix of, of telco, media companies, tech companies, all fishing in the same pond for different reasons. So in the end, there is a lot of uh, uh, dynamics going on in, in, in the industry. And um, I think the challenge or the situation where we're in, so we are, we're an established media company uh, originating from its TV and broadcasting business, right? And I think the, the particular situation that we're in that many corporates uh, have to face that are maybe not digital native companies is to balance innovation and existing business. Um, and I think that there are many examples how this can fail, but also examples how it can work out. And I think the challenge is to find the right balance and to pivot uh, at, the right, at, the right, uh, at the right time. And I think it's easier said than done. Um, I think for us, the, the, the main challenge is, first of all, um, I think there are two types of, of innovation. The one is more radical and the other one is really more into how do you adapt your current business to the new world, right? Um, and I think uh, in the end it requires uh, similar skills, but I think the art is to transition the heritage and the DNA that you have to the new realities and the new, um, uh, the new dynamics. So in our case, to make it specific is, so we are, we are, we are a company that is creating entertainment brands, shows um, uh, that, that, that has a certain proposition for an audience when it comes to content. We are a great com a content company, we create many shows. So the question is, how do you bring that from the TV world to the digital world, right? And um, I think one, one case where it becomes quite obvious is that it's, it's very clear that uh, IP in, in content will still be essential in the future, right? And um, so this doesn't change. So what we need to adapt is, so how it is consumed, um, so what are new platforms changing in the way people consume content? It's becoming shorter, it's becoming more interactive, it's, uh, it's not linear, of course. So these are the, the, the obvious things. And then you need to ask yourself, so what does it mean for, for the core of your business? How do you transition it? And in our case, just to pick in a specific example is, so we have to face the reality that people consume our content, not only on our platforms, but on all social uh, uh, and video platforms in the, in the, out there. So we need to adapt and we need to build um, our system and infrastructure in a way that we quickly can distribute content to many platforms, uh, adjust to the dynamics of the market that this year, Snapchat is the one, the next year, TikTok is the one, and the year after it will be a different one. So you need to adapt your core infrastructure to make that happen. On the other hand, uh, and I think uh, we're talking about more radical stuff, and this is where also uh, the, the team in Sofia comes into place, right? Um, because we need to uh, experiment with completely new opportunities. So, uh, and we need, to, um, we need to try those out and, and, and be quick, right, to, to, um, to bring things to market. So this is where our team in Sofia comes into play because it's, um, it's definitely a product-minded team. So it has a lot of autonomy. So it's not like sending over spec sheets and letting them code, but it's really to build up a autonomous product team in Sofia and it's an organic extension of what we have in Munich. So we have actually two models. So the model one is that we have completely autonomous teams in Sofia who own a product end to end, right? So, um, and on the other hand, we have distributed teams. So basically we have a part of a team sitting in, in Sofia and the other part sitting in, in Germany. Right, and the other, in, in the end, we expect uh, from those teams the same degree of, of innovation like from our teams in Munich. Um, so expectations are high. At the same time, we, we see great talent and we also see a great ecosystem to tap into. So there are many people who want to engage and we are very open to it uh, to bring those uh, people um, on board. 
So in the end, the team in Sofia for us is really a, a, a extension of, of our teams in Munich. And it has a lot of autonomy and ownership and responsibility to develop new products. Mm. Right. Eric, you managed to build also quite an autonomous organization here in, in Sofia for SMU. Can you elaborate a bit more? And um, I mean, you're, the team here is not just responsible for technical development, but so much more. Um, and what is the, how does the local organization um, uh, is being a part of the innovation process at SMU? So generally speaking, I mean, the Sofia office is larger than the San Francisco one. And the Sofia office is probably 40% of the headcount, which is not engineering. So for example, we have a team of people in the marketing which are driving the partnerships. Uh, we have some partnerships with some media companies. So in India, for example, we have a partnership with Times Bridge. In Germany, actually, we are a partner of Prozibben, who is an investor of Smul, which enables us to present, for example, The Voice Germany. It's a cooperation, and we are featured over there. And actually, all those media partnerships, which involves a lot of creative, a lot of design, a lot of marketing strategy, are done out of Sofia. So it's not only about engineering. We indeed have a lot of autonomous team, which spread through creative, which means content, video, uh, static, music creation, uh, marketing in terms of partnership. We do have a lot of product marketing. And both of all those functions are able to operate very efficiently. And the strategy we, we establish is each site. We have two sites. We have San Francisco and Sofia. Given the fact they're separated with 10 hours time difference, uh, we enable them to operate based on structure called squads, which enables to bring in to the same pot engineering, product, product marketing, uh, creative, so that they can trace their own road. And that enables uh, fast deployment, fast interaction. Now, to go back to your question, yes, it's fundamental. I don't believe that you can only have an R&D center in a specific location. And I think that's probably the setup we got right uh, with SMIL, uh, which is really to enable this combination from marketing down to the engineering to work together. So uh, today, it's a very interesting group of people because they are too able to expose themselves to what's happening to the outside world. And there is nothing more exciting to have them to be able to drive creative content creation based on the geography. Mm. You don't want to have the same content creation for Indonesia or Malaysia than you have for France or for UK. So we are able to differentiate a bit of content creation based on the geography. Equally, you want to make sure that some of the Halloween, for example, celebrations are targeted to the countries which celebrate Halloween. Not all the countries are doing this. And a lot of this logic, including the creative creation in and out of Sofia. So it's much more, it's part of the evolution of the ecosystem. 10 years ago, you would not have been able to do this. Now, with a little bit of thinking, uh, Bulgaria has developed uh, some type of other industry, whether it is movie. Um, the movie industry, I think, has been very helpful in this to enable a lot of visual creation, just to develop all those skills. And today we are able to get pretty decent pool of uh, creative talents on the market. We all know that uh, the music scenery is fantastic. So we do have some very strong music engineers working for us. So we've been able to bundle a little bit all those creative talent, not only the engineering, and to bring them together. Uh, we have a say which is, uh, Alone, it's music, and uh, together, it's magic. So it works pretty well. Um, I was actually also curious. Uh, was it hard to um, to convince um, U.S. stakeholders to open up such an autonomous organization here in Bulgaria? Was it challenging, and especially for you as as uh, as French? I mean, you've spent really long time in in Bulgaria, but still. Um, no, that was okay because actually um, the randomness of life makes that I worked with 
some of the people there before. So there was an initial capacity. The initial plan was different. We were planning to have 40 people by the end of 2019. We ended up by being close to 150. Uh, go and find someone to build an office in Sofia of 150 people in 18 months. That's complicated, but it worked. And I think the reason why it worked is because since day one, the plan was to not only do an engineering group. Hmm. And that's why it worked, because we've been able to combine all those various components, including the business side. Um, if you're able to have an office in Sofia, which includes some business entities, uh, whether it is analytic, whether it is marketing, business development, you name it, partnership strategy, uh, that really helps to have your development team to innovate because now they are in direct contact and direct touch with what's happening outside. And I think it's generally speaking why I believe the outsourcing business in the country is fading away. Probably we might see in the future some very nice story coming up. Very well. Um, <clears throat> my next question goes to Stefan Zlatev. Um, I know that you're doing lots of research on, on the trends and, and business models. Um, can you walk us uh, through the process of spotting the opportunities and uh, evaluating whether a given business or technology has a significant potential to achieve a real breakthrough from breakthrough energy ventures perspective? <laughs> right. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so we're in a in a way unique funds because we are a deep tech fund investing in climate mitigating technologies. So when we develop our investment thesis, we're looking from our lenses, really, uh, which can be quite different from any other VCs. Different VCs have different investment theses and targets and goals. Um, in general, like reading. So how how come how the first the first question is like how can you come to a new trend, how can you develop a new trend or figure out there's a new trend in the market? And having a pulse on the market is very important. It's very important for a startup, it's very important for an investor as well. Figure out where the trends and where are potentially companies that are developing something early stage. Uh, so tapping into academic, the academic environment for a deep tech fund is very important. Um, so all the top universities globally um, are kind of like one way. Uh, using your network of other uh, investors who are sharing deals quite often, it's also very important because there's a lot of syndication uh, in the deal space. And then reading, uh, clearly like reading, various, and there's no shortage of news these days, uh, but focusing on certain mediums is very important to figure out kind of like what's actually the current trend. Once you kind of have a trend, uh, then from our perspective, it's like we invest in climate change technologies. So everything that can mitigate 0.5 gigatons CO2 emissions per year. Um, and that's to give a kind of a benchmark that's around 1% of the global emissions. So we're really targeting like big technologies. Technologies which are hard, which nobody really wants to do uh, because it just like, takes a lot of capital. And we are aware of that. Uh, and that's why we're a billion dollar fund. And that's just a drop in the bucket of what probably any technology that can mitigate or the, the global, uh, wait, the, the world is going to require much more than one dollars. Uh, but, but focusing on those deep, on those big technologies is our kind of like main focus to start with. So once we figure out that oh, there's, a, there's space there, we can mitigate 0.5 gigatons, then it's very traditional VC play for us. Uh, we're looking at the team. Uh, it's much, it's kind of like there's the saying, do you bet on the jockey or on the horse? Uh, we definitely bet on the jockey. We definitely bet that team, a smart team, capable team, driven team uh, with complementary skills and, and kind of like go through the walls and can actually break down any barriers to technology development rather than bet on technology and then figure out where the team can actually scale that, et cetera. Uh, and then definitely the technology has to be unique. We have to believe we're a technical team. We have to believe that the technology has the potential to really be an X better solution to problem we're trying to tackle. Uh, and then the market. Unless the technology can actually have a positive unit economics at some point and can actually get market traction, then there's no way this technology is going to scale and is going to mitigate 1% of the global emissions. So all of that has to align for any, any of our bets to kind of like materialize. And of course, 
as of any single VC, you're aware that one out of 10 companies, uh, hopefully more, uh, is only going to make it. Probably a lot of them are going to fail. Uh, and that's why it's a big risk uh, play. Mm. Um, you mentioned uh, complementary um, members of uh, or uh, members of the team which have complementary skills. Today, I had a very interesting conversation uh, with Ludwig Gatzik where he was explaining a bit more how culture can get in the way of strategy when it comes to innovation and how important actually the culture is. In this sense, I wanted to ask you, um, when it comes to complementary skills and complementary uh, teams, is diversity in some way um, something that you're looking at, or if you're looking at the successful teams, is it something which is uh, which is there? Um, so diversity start with in our fund. I have to say, like relatively to the industry standard, and it's a low bar. Unfortunately, <laughs> we're much more diverse, uh, both across gender, race, nation, national uh, people from different nationality. Uh, in terms of the companies, diversity also plays a role. Uh, clearly, when it's much easier being a founder, being an entrepreneur, it's a very lonely journey. Uh, so definitely have a team is very important. Having a co-founder is also, I can believe, very important uh, because together you're much stronger as long as you have complementary skills. So one of them, can, you can one of you can be very technically focused. Uh, another one can be much more market driven, much more like a salesperson. So at the end of the day, it's an entrepreneur. You have to sell your idea. You have to sell your idea to the investors. You have to sell your idea to the customers. Um, you have to sell your idea to your employees. You have to be able to hire a, a team that's actually going to propel you to um, billion dollar plus valuation, uh, which is all kind of like what VCs are aiming for. Uh, and the diversity plays a role. So, for example, we recently made a bet um, in the alternative milk space, uh, actually for, for breastfeeding, and the team. We decided the team has to be all female because they understand from the best, right? We don't know much about the space, it's males, uh, and definitely we realize we want some big board member who's going to join that team, won't come from our VC, is going to be independent, and just to align the interest of the customers and to be better, to be closer to the customer as well. Um, so diversity definitely plays a role, and definitely we're looking for that. Mm. Um, Stefan Atanasov, you're experiencing diversity in a, in a different way. You have uh, teams which have both probably very German background and then you have uh, here in Bulgaria people who are with very Bulgarian background. I can um, imagine that uh, uh, these cultures are very complementary, to put it diplomatic. Um, is it, um, is it, are you benefiting from this diversity in the teams in terms of innovation? So I, I, I think diversity is an interesting thing because I think diversity is great as long as, let's say, the different perspectives have some sort of common ground and, and can get along with each other. Because I think um, uh, the risk um, is that if you have, let's say, two diverse, um, two diverse uh, let's say, components or team members, uh, also culturally, Right, it can become also quite challenging if there is no common grounds and if there is no, uh, uh, let's say, way how this this uh, this team members can get along. So what we see is in I think in the case of of the team in in Bulgaria and the team in in Germany, it's it's definitely complementary in a sense that I think culturally the difference there is certainly a difference, but I think culturally the difference between Bulgaria and Germany isn't that. That's significant, right? I think we're we're all we're all Europeans, um, and uh, we we share certain uh, shared background and values and, and 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 culture. So this helps. And then I think you have uh, uh, certainly diversity that in that case is helpful, right? Because um, you may uh, you might have let's say a more strategic um, and long term approach. I would rather be associated, let's say, with a with a German mentality, uh, while in in Bulgaria you might have a, a more pragmatic and let's get it done approach in certain things, and this can be very helpful. So um, I think you need to be conscious about how uh, how to deal with diversity, but I think if done right, 
it's definitely something very positive. And I'm in, in, I can only say that in our case, uh, let's say the diversity between Germany and, and Bulgaria is definitely creating value for us um, and is uh, beneficial for the company. Mm. Eric, you're also an interesting case, uh, a company which is led by a French and then at the same time, I know that you are um, a great part of your team are Bulgarians who have studied abroad. So in a way, uh, their background is enriched with other cultures. Um, is it uh, is it a good thing that to be so diverse it's Mule? I think the diversity works extremely well huh? as long as you make sure the people are aligned on the values. And I've never had this issue anywhere, wherever I've been working. Um, and when you create a company and when you hire people, the key is to align on the values. So you can have people to learn the skills, because skills can be learned, but values are very difficult to be changed. That's one aspect where I'm always very, very careful. So we foster a certain amount of values which are shared between our offices. And generally speaking, the cultural differences are not the issue. The different our values are. And more than the diversity, I believe into diversity, even in Sofia, we have some people coming from Asia, coming from Western Europe, coming from North America, working for us. Uh, that's great. It works extremely well, but simply because we are aligned in the values. Mm. We want our people to be curious. We want these to be interested. So we have a certain amount of values, and it's one of our sourcing type of benchmark, which is, yes, we check the skills, but we do not compromise on the on the value side because this is when there is an issue later on in terms of team integration. Before we continue to the questions from uh, the audience, I have a last one, and you can show you can answer it actually quite quite quickly, maybe with uh, just one sentence. Um, if right now in May twenty two, uh, assuming the quarantine is over tomorrow, and I think it is. Uh, if you could start a new business from scratch, what would it, would, would you do it and what would it be? Um, Ivalo, I see that uh, maybe you're prepared with an answer already. Smiling because actually I've spent uh, so many years now on the, uh, on the marketing software space, um, in both in Limplum and before that in Telerik in progress, uh, launching marketing cloud. So, Obviously, I'm thinking in, the, in that direction. So if I had to launch another company tomorrow, it will pretty much be aligned with the insights that I have from the market during the last one year. And it will, it will be very close to the vision of Limpon 2021, <laughs> to be honest, uh, which I cannot share right now. Uh, but maybe that's something that we can spend more time in another event discussing. Mm. Uh, so definitely, I would continue in, in the same kind of space. Miro, where do you see the sweet spot? Would you start a new company again? Definitely. I, I firmly believe that times of stress are actually also times for great opportunities. It's every, I mean, the, the current situation is shaking the, the, the game board and new models are actually possible. Uh, I mean, in, in, in good times where funding is abundant, it's super easy. I mean, you know what they say, when the wind is strong, even the chickens can fly. But now, great idea that is serving a new demand has a, has a green field to grow. I think it's a great time. If you're asking me about idea, um, I think 2008 gave us the, the, the shared economy. So probably COVID-19 will give us the remote economy. So if I start something, it should be something like this. And I, I, actually, we're doing it to develop at the moment. Our business is for, for this remote economy. Mm. Remote economy is a good term. I like it very much. Uh, Stefan, I'm sure that you have a, a great idea. You're nodding. Would you start a new company? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I have to agree with the rest of the panel so far. Why right? definitely is the right time to start a new company. Uh, and there, there are several ideas. Uh, there are two kind of verticals which I'm focusing on right now. Uh, one of them is around the recycling space. I believe it's a super broken industry, and there's a lot of technology can play in that space. And I believe why COVID is going to only accelerate the waste we're generating with all these disposable utensils and everything else. And the other one, I think, mental health. Mental health is something which I believe is going to be more and more prevalent 
and especially in Europe as well. Uh, I think the U.S. is already realizing the benefits of that. Uh, I think that's an interesting space, and the whole holistic integration of healthcare, like both kind of like mental health and the traditional sense, something which I believe is going to be very interesting and very interesting to figure out the solutions there. Mm. Stefan Atanasov, I don't know if the how is the is the quarantine lifted up already in Germany? I'm not quite sure. I haven't checked yet, but. Uh, yeah, if it was like assuming it's over tomorrow, what would you do? What kind of startup company would you do? Um, I think it was uh, Mir uh, Miroslav who, who said before that um, I think that the, the crisis has shaken up many, many industries. And I think it's it's probably not very, very sexy, but I, I, I truly believe that uh, a lot of industries realize or a lot of established industries realized uh, where they are lacking certain digital capabilities. So, uh, and I think there are many, many examples. And I think now that these industries have been shaken up, I think the attention for these kind of, of let's say, uh, digital transformation of these businesses. And I think, especially in Germany, it's quite interesting because you have, I mean, the success of the economy is, is a lot driven by established, uh, uh, established companies uh, that are mid-size, right? But at the same time, they are also global leaders in their space, right? And at the same time, I think many of them are clearly still lacking uh, a clear digital strategy. I think many of these uh, these companies now realized um, what they are lacking. And I think to tap into this kind of space, uh, and I don't really have, let's say, a specific idea, but I think there are many many, many options, um, I think helping these companies to realize uh, or to, to transform uh, driven by, let's say, the learnings they had throughout the crisis, I think is a huge business opportunity that lies somewhere in, in, the, in the consulting space, in the, in the uh, space of, of helping them um, grow. And, and uh, I think this is a huge opportunity for these industries. Um, but also uh, for, for service companies to help them achieve that. So um, I think this is definitely an interesting space to go into. Eric, where is your sweet spot? What kind of uh, opportunity would you take in the, in the post-COVID world? If anybody wants to do a teleporting company, count me in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming to you, <laughs> definitely. Um, <laughs> more seriously, though, I, I think it's a serious topic. Um, but more seriously, I think the virtualization of certain business is going to be even more important. So th there is the, sh the shopping side. We have all experienced shopping online during those last few weeks. We have all experienced the different of experience. We have all experienced how difficult it is to choose some basic goods out of an online platform who has been crowded and could not deliver. And there might be a lot of initiative moving their way in terms of augmented reality or virtualization of the shopping, either for the baseline or for the eye-hand clothing and so on. So that's one track. I think one thing we've been learning in the last few weeks is virtual education deserves a very serious upgrade because Zoom plus Google Classroom reminds me a few decades ago what was a screen and a computer. <laughs> so I'm not surprised that there will be significant improvement there. It's, it's really important actually because Zoom is a one-way type of communication. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of evolution from there pretty soon, simply because it is important. Mm. The last one is probably on the health. Uh, virtual doctors is a business that actually has been significantly increasing. Uh, that's something that is going to likely improve and increase. Uh, and to, it raises a lot of questions around privacy, security, and data protection. I would expect this vector to be an interesting source of inspiration over the next few years. Mm. Um, we don't have much time left, but still, I think it's an important question that uh, maybe we should uh, tackle. Uh, it's coming from Sanjay. Um, who is asking that, um, how do you encourage the innovation and safe-to-fail culture in your organizations? 
Um, Ivailo, should we start with you or maybe you can also, we, we tried sure. a trick yesterday where you can raise a hand so that I know that you have an answer already. Um, but I'm on, on our side, I guess uh, it's not so much um, about encouraging innovation because uh, the market is driving you. Uh, if you are on a market that's, that's scaling fast and uh, you're solving an important problem, it is driving you uh, to innovate. Um, how do you make it safe to fail? Well, a very practical example uh, is our, and I believe um, Christo might have mentioned it already in his interview, our um, OKR and goal-driven um, execution where we have stretch goals, um, people can reach for the stars and, and fail, um, and also align their strong commitments with the rest of the organization. I think that's a very important instrument in that direction. Yeah, I can only agree. I think in the end, um, you just need to uh, live practices in your company that that uh, support uh, support that approach. And I think it's also uh, important to not only talk about failure, but also the the learnings that you generate out of it. And uh, I think there are many practical things that that you can share uh, that that you can do. For example, you could you you could even actively talk about failure yeah you could you could even have events where teams are uh talking about the experiences and situations where they failed because this can be very helpful learning for other teams right and the moment you embrace these kind of discussions uh it creates it immediately creates uh, uh um uh, it really makes this this creates this atmosphere and um i think for the leadership team it's especially uh, important to create that trust in, uh, in, in, in your teams that uh, even if you fail and you learn out of it and you react adequately, it's, it's okay, right? And I think this is a leadership task then uh, as well to, to make that happen and create this culture in the company. Mm. Miro, do you have even space to fail at this point that, uh, in a startup like the Valiot? How do you foster such a culture? I think everybody fails daily. Um, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with the other guys. I mean, uh, the important thing is the trust and uh, and uh, the lessons learned from what you get. I mean, we failed a lot, and this actually helped us to, uh, to to come here. And how to make it safe to fail? Well, I think I'll go. I'll go again. Go with accountability. I mean. Uh, if, if when you're an entrepreneur, you have all the good intentions that you're going to succeed. You have a vision of the world and how stuff should be done. And actually, the these failures that you go through, they're the fine tuning of your uh, of your products and your business. So if you go with this idea, this is actually what creates the safe space. It's the necessary evil in order for you to get better. And if the management and the and the C levels of the company understand it, I mean, the safety comes by itself. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, I'm really um, sad that we have to wrap it up because I don't want to steal from the show time of the next uh, session. Uh, thank you for joining us from different parts, actually, of, uh, of the world. Um, it was quite insightful to hear the different perspectives from such a different organizations. Um, there are some things that you can basically see which are pretty, pretty common, and uh, we will probably summarize them in uh, in the in the resume after the of this discussion after the after the conference. Um, please uh, take part also in the other sessions. Um, in the next one, we will be talking more, even more concretely uh, about pivoting. Uh, your business model during the crisis, uh, taking example from um, three different startups here from the Bulgarian ecosystem, might be also interesting for you. Thank you, guys, and um, for now, uh, I wish you a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.